Ocean Hills at its best is when we are in it together. Good news to me would be uh, getting guitar lessons from Brad Paisley at French Press. It would be that the ringing in my right ear had stopped. Good news to me would be if Dodgers won the World Series. Then I won the lottery and I won a million dollars. I would jump up and down and be so excited. Uh, I think if somebody gave me good news, it would be that uh, I could be retired. Here's some money, go travel. <laughs> good news to me would be if I got to work from home in my yoga pants and eat mac and cheese. Good news to me would be sitting in my yoga pants working next to Chanel. If someone gave me good news, it would be that I had front row tickets to a Justin Bieber concert. If someone gave me good news, it would be that I had a lifetime supply of Starbucks. Good news to me would be if someone offered to pay for all of my college loans. Good news to me would be if ice cream was the new diet food. So the question becomes, what is not just good news to you, but what is the good news? In Matthew, all the way in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus shows up on the scene and it says that he was, uh, he was preaching and he was saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And soon after this he said, Jesus was going throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. Now... For you Bible scholars, this is Matthew chapter 4, and Jesus is already proclaiming the good news, but he hasn't died yet, and he hasn't risen yet. What did he say? Was Jesus born on the wrong side of the cross? Could he, could he not get his, uh, his message going? Why? Is this, is this not up yet? <laughs> Technical difficulty. I'm going to try this one more time just to boot this. Is it up now? Okay. But what was Jesus talking about in Matthew chapter 4? Matthew uses this word over and over in his gospel, and then later on, so we, we must get some sort of sense that in Matthew, the gospel has something to do here. It says he was going around and he was, he was preaching the gospel and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. So it was something that Jesus was proclaiming. In fact, in the, in the Greek, he was gospeling the gospel. He was good newsing the good news. He was saying something good. What was he saying in Matthew chapter 4? You ever think about that? Well, in Mark, he uses the gospel, the word gospel, over six times. In fact, he comes out swinging. Mark 1, verse 1, he says, the beginning of the gospel, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. And he used the word several other times, and then he says, to his disciples at the end of all this, go into the world and preach the gospel to all creation. So the gospel, according to Mark, has something to do with all of creation, which is kind of uh, everything. So the gospel has something to do with everything. Besides that, you know, it's, it's fairly insignificant. Okay, in Luke, he uses it again six different times. And the, he's, the good news, the good, in fact, John the Baptist was the first one to preach the gospel. So this is before Jesus' ministry, and John the Baptist was preaching the good news what was it? Jesus hadn't died. He hadn't risen from the dead yet. What was he preaching? And at one point Jesus said, go and report to John. This is now Jesus. All that you've seen and heard, the blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. So in Luke, the good news has something to do with healing and restoration and the poor. In the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, there's a couple different times where Jesus sends out his disciples to preach the good news. I think, oh, these poor guys, what'd they have to say? Jesus hadn't died, he hadn't risen from the dead yet, and he sends them out two by two. You ever think at one point did they look at each other and go, uh, what do we say? Well, they had no idea that he was going to die, they had no idea that he was going to raise from the dead, and they had no idea, frankly, that he was God in the flesh. They knew he was a really good rabbi, and he was pretty special, and had a lot of power. What did they talk about? John actually doesn't use the word gospel in his, uh, in his gospel. 
Uh, but it shows up some over 60 times in the New Testament after this. Paul and Peter, you go ahead and look those up. Paul and Peter uh, use this word over and over, and they use it both as a verb and a noun. And Paul calls it the gospel of grace. He calls it my gospel, the gospel that I gave to you, the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so the question becomes, what is the gospel? This question has haunted me uh, for a long time. I remember I was leaving class at Westmont after an American Christianity class, and we were studying all these different types of, you know, different sects, S-E-C-T-S, in, uh, of the church, and, uh, and, uh, and we were sort of critiquing, well, here's where the Anabaptists had it right, and here's where they had it wrong, and here's where the Moravians had it right. And it, and it started to think, well, what are they going to say about us? What are they going to say about our take of the gospel, where we got it and where we got off? And so this question has been haunting me in a wonderful way for a long time. What is the gospel? So this morning in our message uh, together, I want to do a couple things. I want to do three things specifically. One is I want to confuse us a little bit. I want to mess us up a little bit. I want to kind of muddle things up a little bit because sometimes we think of what the gospel is and, and we, we, we package it in this very neat and tidy a couple phrases as if that captures the entire good news of Jesus. And I want to kind of mess that up a little bit this morning. I may even tick some people off. That's okay. The second thing I want to do is introduce for us a metaphor that might help us think about how big and how good the good news of Jesus really is. What is it? And the third thing is I want to take... Um, one of the implications out of that metaphor and talk about specifically what is the good news for G, uh, of Jesus for our minds? What does the gospel have to do with how we think, what we see, what, how we, uh, what we say, etc.? What is the good news for our minds? And so John and I are going to spend the next several weeks together working through this idea of the good news for different parts of who we are. So that's what I'm going to do. Well, so I'm still in the, in the phase where, where I'm confusing us, so let me keep going with that. What is the gospel? Well, first of all, we have to start disassembling some things and say, what is not the gospel? What the gospel is not. And, and, I, and I'm just going to pick a few things that I call lesser gospels. And I think these are very, actually, very common in the church today, at least in the modern Western church that we're in the middle of. Uh, the gospel means good news. It means a proclamation of good and, uh, and here's some ways that this has been, I think, overly reduced. First of all, you have the consumeristic gospel. This is sort of the gospel is only about me and how I can be improved. And I think this one hits me between the eyes when I think, well, Jesus is mostly, if I just sort of add some Jesus into my life and then kind of keep my life going, I'll just kind of buy me some Jesus. And hopefully that will make my life better. And there's a lot that we do to consumerize Jesus that I don't think is, is truly fair to the gospel. The second one, and this kind of hits us here in this fine country, is the individualistic gospel. And that is the gospel is really just about me, that I'm kind of at the center of this story. And community is optional. It's just kind of me and Jesus uh, trucking along together. Did you know that when Paul writes the New Testament, that almost entirely when you see the word you, like Y-O-U, you, that it's y'all, he's always writing to a community. But we have so individualized the gospel. And, and, you know, the Psalms, which has been the worship book of, of the church for thousands of years, has Psalms where it's individually centered and, and saying, this is my experience of God. But it also has talking about God's movement as a people and everything else. So even our worship music needs to include bigger themes than only what's going on in me, the individual. Another lesser gospel. I'm going to start ticking people off now. Another lesser gospel would be a salvation-only centered gospel. That the gospel is only about me getting out of hell and going to some place called heaven someday. Now, I believe that salvation is right smack dab in the middle of the good news of Jesus. Jesus is the Savior, absolutely. But that's not all he is. And we're going to look at some of that today. So when the gospel gets reduced to just a way that you and I get to escape badness, to go to heaven, that's been overly reduced. You've taken really good news of Jesus and we've, we've just boiled it down to where it's actually not helpful anymore. That salvation actually won't save your life. It won't change your life if it just stays that small. 
taking anybody off yet? Therapeutic gospel, another lesser gospel. The gospel is only about me getting better. The nationalistic gospel. This is, oops a daisy. This is the gospel that says that God is only about my people. So like Chris Rock when he says, God bless America and nobody else. Okay, that's a nationalistic gospel. That says that God is only for my country and my people. That's a lesser gospel. Then you have the jewelry Jesus gospel. This is uh, Jesus is crucified and he's always dying for my sins and he's staying on the cross on my neck but he's never really requiring anything from me as my Lord. The gospel is not something that can be reduced down to a few ideas. The gospel can't be stuck on a napkin. This, this word, and even when Jesus talks about what the kingdom of God is, he keeps using pictures to try to describe how good and how big this is because a picture is worth a thousand words. And so Jesus speaks almost entirely in pictures. Okay, hopefully I'm now done with the confusion part. And I want to move into the second part and start talking about what is the gospel and give us a little bit of a, uh, a metaphor that might work. First of all, when Jesus gospeled, when he proclaimed good news, his number one topic among everything else was the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is like this. The kingdom of God is like this. The kingdom of God can be compared to this or this. Let me tell you about the story of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is sort of like this, and he speaks in word pictures, these parables. Now, in Matthew, this phrase shows up as the kingdom of heaven, and it's not just talking about going to heaven someday. The only reason that Matthew has the word heaven in there is because he's writing to a Jewish audience and a Jewish person would not keep writing God, 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 God. So he's saying he inserts the word heaven, but he means the same thing, the kingdom of God. What is it? Well, here's a very simple definition of it that, that helps us understand it. It won't capture it all. But the kingdom of God is any place that the will of God is done. Wherever God is king, that's his kingdom. So it can be in your heart. It can be in a place. It can be outside of time and space. Wherever God is king and his will is being done, that's the kingdom. And when Jesus talks about the kingdom of God, he uses exciting language. He uses, uh, he uses in-breaking, like pregnant language, Okay. I told Casey, Casey, if you're, if you're going to have the baby this morning, just let me know and I'll cut this thing short. Okay, it's that kind of, there is something about to happen to the Yardley family. I mean, it's imminent, in case you didn't notice. Okay? Casey's not been throwing a lot of beer down lately, okay? She's <laughs> pregnant, she has a child coming. There's this imminent moment about to happen, and that's the kind of language that Jesus uses about the kingdom. He says the kingdom of God is at hand. It's breaking in. It's here. It's within you. Jesus keeps talking about the kingdom of God. So there's different ways to talk about the gospel. It's more than just Jesus dying and raising. It's more than just him saving us from something. So the first definition I want to give us might look something like this. That the gospel is Jesus Christ. It's his life. It's, it's, it's Jesus. It's all of Jesus. It's his life. It's his teachings. It's his saving work on the cross. It's his resurrection. And it's his ongoing invitation to you and I. Just like John O'Prayed. His invitation for you and I to join in to his mission. That's the good news. That's big. It's everything. It's all of Jesus. Here's another one that might help. That the gospel is the proclamation that Jesus, the crucified and risen Lord, that's not working for some reason, is the Messiah and he's the Lord. That Jesus, the crucified Messiah, is Lord. So he doesn't just come as a savior. That's never, he never stops there. That's actually not an option. We have this difference in the spread between, well, we'll spread the good news and then we'll grow people up into it. And it's actually all one thing. 
The message that we should proclaim to people at the very front door is Jesus is the Lord. He's the Savior of the world, and He's the Lord. Come follow Him. Don't just receive Him. Come follow Him. That's the good news. That's the good news. Paul in Galatians 5 gives us one short sentence that I think might come as close to anything to capturing all of it, all of the scriptures, all of everything. It's one of these phrases, it's a few words, and yet it's like this deep pool. And he says this in Galatians 5.1, it was for freedom that Christ has set you free. It was for freedom that Christ has set you free. What is freedom? What does it look like? What does it smell like? What does it feel like in your life? What does it mean to be a free person? Paul says, this is why all this happened. This is why Jesus came. This is why he died. This is why he rose from the dead. Here's the point of all of this. It's for freedom. For you, for me, for all of creation, for the world. Freedom. What does that look like? Sometimes we can just look too detailed at something and say, well, the gospel is just this thing and the good news, he just means A, B, C, D. What if it's bigger? What if it's freedom? You know, it's almost like you've got to take the plane and raise it up to about 30,000 feet and get that view and say, what, this is what the good news of Jesus is. It's for freedom. So I have uh, some friends that uh, own a vineyard, Milt and Marilyn Honey, and actually Milt is now gone to be with the Lord. But... Uh, Milt was one of these guys who was a turnaround manager. He'd go into these corporations and, uh, you know, take no salary, just stock options, and turn this dying company around into this very successful business and cash out and go on to the next one. He's just a very bright guy and very competent and a very hard worker. Well, I, I met Milt in Maryland when they moved to Santa Barbara because they were retiring from uh, this kind of uh, charging life and came to Santa Barbara. And it was one of Milt's dreams to always have a vineyard. And so he finally made the decision. He bought this farm out in San Ynez, and it had a few grapevines on it, but he wanted to turn it into a vineyard. So, man, he, he did what he did with all these other companies. He studied. He went and met with experts, people at UC Davis and Cal Poly. And, and all of a sudden, Milt's the president of the Vintners Association in San Ynez Valley and, and brings that little association of, of winemakers into a whole other place now. Uh, with his business acumen and savviness and all this stuff. So, so he decides he's going to turn his little farm into an Italian vineyard, only it, Italian grapes. And he goes to Italy and studies how to do this. And, and so I just talked to Milt about what he's doing. Because I don't know if you guys know this, but Jamie and I are kind of a big deal in the, in the winemaking business. I got three vines at my house, so kind of a big deal. Three grape vines. Uh, so wh whatever Milt was doing with his grape vines, I would say, well, I'm going to do that with mine right now. So, you know, I've gone to the, v I've gone to the VSP model of, of, of how you hang the fruit. You know, the branches come up and you only let four branches on each vine uh, because you want to consolidate the sugar, uh, the bricks, you know, for each grape so that you get the best yield. And so, you know, and, and Milt would teach me this and, and he would plant beans in between the rows exactly four feet apart. And, and because that would put nitrogen in the soil and all this stuff at this vineyard and just for these, for these grapes, right? And so I want to get in on this. I tell Marilyn one day, I, I want to be part of the harvest. It's sort of this romantic picture of what harvesting grapes will be. So I show up at like 4.30 in the morning one time out there. And, uh, and I want to say this. I'm no Kip Bradley, but I'm a pretty hard worker. I mean, I can, I can work pretty hard. Kip's, he's not human, but you know, for the rest of us, I work pretty hard. These guys were working circles around me. I mean, I was just happy at the end of the day to have all my fingers. You know, you're clipping away. Your pants are caked with sugar water, and they're heavy. And I, my back was killing me. But here we are harvesting, and it's all about this day. It's all about grapes. But actually, it's not all about grapes, is it? Grow the grapes for, class, wine. It's all about the wine, right? But actually, if you take the plane up to 30,000 feet and you say, what's this all about? What's all the planting the beans and the clipping and the fourth? What's, it, what's this all about? It's not about the grapes. It's not about the wine. It's about good moments. That's what it's about. That's what wine's about. It's about having a glass of wine with friends and a nice dinner and, and just this moment. That's what all this is about. So what if the gospel... 
What is the gospel about? What if it's about freedom? Living lives where we become free, where we're able to shed the stuff that we lumber around with in this life. Stuff that's handed to us that we didn't choose and stuff that we chose. What if the gospel is about freedom? What if the gospel, the good news of Jesus, means that we get to walk away and out of those shackles the more we follow Jesus and become a free man and a free woman? I think that's what the gospel is about. So here's the metaphor I want to share with you. If my handy-dandy computer was working right now, you would see a picture on the screen. And it's an African-American woman in pink sweats, and her head is over here, and his shoulders, her shoulders are over here, her abdomen's over here, her waist is over here, and her feet are over here. She's disintegrated. She's a mess. And I saw this in an airline magazine one time, and I saw this picture, and I thought, my gosh, this is us. This is me. Not that I think that I am jogging in pink sweats, but I think this picture is my life. I'm so often disintegrated. Like, I don't do what I believe. Or the things that I say don't match up with who I am. Or the places I go don't fit into what I believe. I'm this disintegrated person. And so I started to think about this disintegrated person. I said, what if, what if God puts us all together? What if that's his aim in this whole deal? What if he wants to line us all up? And then I started thinking, okay, well, what's the plumb line? What's, what do we line up under? Because actually, I know what's inside of my head and my heart. I don't know that I want to line up under Scott Lasea. Yeah, that's just a mess waiting to happen. I actually want to line up under something bigger than that, something better than that, something that's really true. I want to make sure that my ladder is leaning against the right building. And so I thought, well, what, what if, what if the, the plumb line is the love of God and the love of neighbor. Because, you know, when Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? I mean, there's thousands of commands. There's Midrash, and there's all these commentaries that the, the rabbis would write, and you could argue back and forth, well, this is the greatest. No, I think this is the greatest. Well, Rabbi Jerichim would say this. And so they came to Jesus to stump him with this and argue with him, and he said, oh, let me tell you quite simply, here's the greatest and he reaffirmed the Shema, the prayer that every Jewish person prays twice a day. It would have been the first prayer they would have ever learned. They pray it when they rise in the morning. They pray it when they go to bed. And it's, God, I want to love you with all of my heart, soul, and strength. And so Jesus adds in the word mind. He says, let me tell you the greatest command. It's to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Your heart and your mind, and your soul, and your strength all lined up. And he says, the second is like it. Love your neighbor with everything. Love your neighbor as yourself. So what if the love of God and the love of neighbor are the thing that we're supposed to become aligned to? Can you imagine what your mind would be like if it was guided by the love of God and neighbor first, foremost, infused with, driven by it, compelled by it, I think that's where we're headed. I think that's his plan. In fact, I know it's his plan. Go home and read Romans 8, the last couple of verses there, 28 and 29. Not the last verses, but 28 and 29, where Paul says this, For we know that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And then he defines what good is. He says, For those that God foreknew, that's you and I, he has always known us, he had a predestiny for and here's his predestiny, that they would be conformed to the image of Jesus, that Jesus might just be the firstborn among many people that look like him, that are all lined up. And that's what I love about Jesus is that he's always lined up. He is what he does, what he says, always. Perfect integrity. Don't you long for that? If you've lived more than like Four years, okay? You long for that in your life. This sense of being lined up and having integrity in every part of who you are. So what if the gospel, what if the gospel is an invitation to all of us to bring all of ourselves into alignment with the love of God and neighbor? You can't do that alone. You got to do it in a community. But what if that's the gospel? What if that view from 30,000 feet says, this is what freedom looks like? 
You just keep walking into love. The love of God and the love of neighbor. This is what this is all about. It's not just about you and I getting out of something someday. It's about a life that begins right now and goes on into forever of becoming aligned with the love of God and the love of neighbor. So the third part of this message is to look at one implication of that. And in uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all record the time when Jesus went out and was tempted by the devil. And Matthew, it says, uh, then Jesus led by the Spirit. Okay, so this is right after his baptism. And I don't know about your baptism experience. It was, mine was pretty good, very special, kind of a neat deal. Um, for me, it was a very intentional deal. I drove myself in high school to my own baptism. My parents did not come with me. And, uh, and it was kind of this moment. I remember leaving the living room saying, okay, I'm going to go get baptized now at this evening service. And they're like, okay, go have a good time. And it was just like, here I go, you know, uh, with or without you. And, uh, and I went, and it was, it was a neat time. But this didn't happen. Uh, Jesus had the Holy Spirit come down like a dove, land on him. The voice of heaven, you know, opened up and said, this is my son, my beloved son, in whom I'm so well pleased. So my experience lacked that. But that was Jesus' experience. And then right after this scene... It says, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. It's like he had an appointment, you know. The devil's like, hey, Jesus, need some time. Uh, We're going to do some tempting. Uh, You know, how's Monday? Ah, I got a baptism. How's Tuesday? Okay. So off they go into the wilderness for 40 days. That number is so significant in Scripture, right? It keeps showing up. When's the last time we think of 40-something in the wilderness? That would be Israel, 40 years, right, wandering out in the wilderness. And it's exactly what Jesus is now going to fulfill. Israel wandered for 40 years and kept usurping God and kept making mistakes and kept going against him. Jesus, the unbroken, undivided, integrated man, is going to go out into the wilderness for 40 days for fasting. I don't know if you fasted for very long, but let me just say this. 40 days is a long time. 40 days is you start to look at your finger and you go, maybe a little garlic salt. You know, this could could work, right? 40 days is hungry. And he goes out there and he is tempted. And after he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, this is the great no-duh statement in all the New Testament. He became hungry. (laughs) Really? Tell me more about it. Well, the Greek is, he became hungry. Okay. And the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. And maybe this story is familiar with you. I'm going to fly through it to make the point. Jesus says, well, a man doesn't live by bread alone, but by, by, by the word of God. And three times he's going to quote Deuteronomy with each tempting. And that kind of mirrors what's happening in the wilderness experience of Israel. But he starts by saying, if you are the son of God, make these stones bread. Very tempting. What's the temptation? Well, make, make some stones bread and you can eat. The second one, he shows them and he says, you know, why don't you, well, can, well, you just bow down to me? And, uh, and Jesus is not going to fall for that one. He says, don't tempt the Lord your God. And then he shows up in a moment of time, shows him all the kingdoms. He says, bow down. And he says, if you are the son of God, then bow down to me. What's the temptation? Is it really the bread? Is Jesus really going to bow down to Satan? Is Jesus really going to throw himself off the pinnacle? Jesus, no, he's going to die and raise from the dead. Apparently that's not the end of the world. What's the real temptation? It's in the question. If you are the son of God. The enemy wants to tempt Jesus. He wants to get him to divide. He wants his mind to get off track. He wants Jesus to not believe the truth that he is the son of God. I know you heard that voice thing at your baptism deal, but you know, if you are the son of God, then do this. And this is always where the tempter will come after you and I to get you and I to doubt that we are children of God, to doubt that we belong, to doubt that that's our real identity. No, you're just, you're always like this. You always do these mistakes. You always linger in this sin. This one always comes back to you. If you really love Jesus, you wouldn't be doing this kind of stuff. He's always going to get us to doubt who we are. And it's what he tries to do to Jesus. Jesus rebukes him because he can't divide. He is what he says and what he does. Perfect integrity. 
So apparently, the good news matters for what we believe, right? Apparently, what we believe about what Jesus is all about matters. I'm telling you, at this stage of my life, it matters. It matters what I believe. It matters if I believe what God has said about himself, and it matters if I believe what God has said about me. I think all sorts of things about me. But you know, the truest thing about God is what he says about himself. And the truest thing about you and about me is what God says about us. So the gospel has implication for our heads and what we believe and how we see the world and ourselves. The good news says you are a son of God. You are a daughter of the king. Believe it and be free. I'm going to ask Jamie to come up and, and pray for us and set up communion from there. <laughs>